Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless comedian heather mcdonald is out of a valley hospital tonight after she collapsed over the weekend during a show at the tempe improv i don't mean to brag i don't care but i want you to know double vaxxed booster flu shot and i'm gonna be honest I have the shingle shot too. Traveled, went to Mexico twice, did shows, meet and greets, never got COVID. Clearly, Jesus loves me the most. Seriously. So nice, so nice. Uh. <laughs> um, so I'm in the emergency room. I look weird. Ugh. I'm so, 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 so sorry. I passed out on stage. I got up, I did one joke, and I felt so dizzy. Oh my God. I can I cannot believe this happened. Martindale, what a f***ing weekend. Yeah. A lot of people ask, do you think Mary sent Jesus for you? I'm like, I possibly. I, I mean, I've never had better comedic timing in my life. I mean, it was just kind of like, wow. And I feel like if Jesus flicked you over, he would have given you a softer landing. He wouldn't have been that I mad know, at you. I know. It's not Jesus, you guys. <laughs> Jesus thinks I'm a hoot. When you send your kids to Catholic school or Christian school, and you're a bit of a lapsed Catholic, as I am, I'll admit it. You know, I go to church when it's important, like if I have a really cute outfit to wear. But <laughs> when you send them to Catholic school, it's like having a bunch of little narcs running around the house. It's like, oh, you said a bad word. You broke one of the Ten Commandments. It's like, oh, f <laughs> Shut up, you narc. Go read your Bible on your iPad. <laughs> Recently, there has been a tremendous increase in mockers and scoffers that are attacking Christianity and the Bible in general. On two occasions, the Bible warns that the closer the coming of the Lord Jesus, the greater the mockers and scoffers will become. 2 Peter 3, 3 and 4. Knowing this first, the scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Jude 1, 17 and 18 But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time, who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. What is so significant in both 2 Peter 3 and Jude is, the prophets and apostles warned about mockers and scoffers. Apparently, the mockers and scoffers are a sure indicator we are living in the last days. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. John 15, 18-20 If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Free speech rights are not only being restricted on social media and streaming services, but also in American high schools. In Plainwell, Michigan, a 16-year-old junior was suspended recently for sharing his Christian faith in private text messages, also at his school locker. Now he's suing the school to have the suspension stricken from his record and to get his reputation back.
Well, joining us from Plainwell, Michigan, is student David Stout and his lawyer, David Coleman of the Great Lakes Justice Center. Thank you both for being with us. So, David, let's uh, start with you, David Stout. What were you texting at home and also saying at your locker that got you in trouble? Well, uh, at home, I had a private uh, text conversation where my friend asked me what my views were on homosexual conduct, and I responded in a uh, biblical way. At school, it would have been anything political, religious, or any normal talk that students might have in the, in the hallway, and it was with people that were like-minded. They didn't have a problem with it. And I know you're a committed Christian. You had three meetings with school officials. So what did the principal say to you when you were suspended for three days? Well, they said that uh, what I had done had made kids feel unsafe in school. They had chosen to skip class and sit in the office instead of come to band. And because of that, it was a disruption to the learning environment, and that's why they uh, have punished me. And I understand that you asked uh, the principal, uh, where can I practice my faith? Where can I speak freely about my faith? What did he tell you? Well, he said that there's two cases where I could uh, uh, speak what I wanted to speak. I could either speak it with a teacher mediating the conversation or behind a closed locked door with, with another person, and that person is... Uh, a like-minded individual. And David Coleman, can high school administrators limit their students' private speech, text messages at home or in a school high hallway? And if, if they're not being disruptive, can they do that? Generally speaking, no, Gary. Uh, there are a couple of exceptions, obviously. If somebody were to make a true threat, you know, I'm gonna blow up the school or shoot up the school or something, obviously they can take action. Or if there's some sort of uh, speech going on among a lot of the kids at the school and it spills over into the school so that there's a disruption, there's a sit-in, there's a protest, or there's some kind of action like that happening that disrupts the school, then theoretically they can take some action uh, to, to stop that kind of speech. But neither of those things apply here. So the bottom line is they're just trying to regulate everyday common speech of the students and that's unconstitutional. And to tell a student to keep their faith at home or behind closed doors, it seems there's also a religious discrimination aspect of this as well, David. What do you say? Yeah, absolutely, which is why we filed the federal 1983 action in federal court for a violation of our client's civil rights, that the, the school is acting under color of state law as a government entity to deprive our client of his civil rights and constitutional protection. So that's why we filed the lawsuit we did. David, have they ever, uh, David Stout, have they ever regulated speech from gay kids or other kids in, in the school? I've been told by those kids that yes, they, the same principals have said the same things to them, that they can't voice their own opinions about uh, gay rights or they can't uh, voice their anti-religious uh, uh, comments if it could potentially harm another student emotionally um, because they disagree with them. And what do you want to see happen, David Stout? And as a Christian, do you have forgiveness here or hard feelings, bitterness? Well, no, I don't I don't have hard feelings. And for, for the band directors, though they may have handled the situation poorly, I don't want them to um, like not have their job anymore. I would like for them to be disciplined, learn from their mistakes, and continue on. And the principals, it would be great if they could also do the same. And what I really want them want to see from them is that they stop limiting the speech, they admit that they're wrong, and set an example for other schools of what you should do to handle these situations, to teach these kids that though you can have disagreements, you can still move past that and handle it as an adult. Do you forgive them, David? I do. Folks, these are our basic First Amendment rights on trial here. We cannot allow faith and speech to be tethered to our homes. The Plainwell, Michigan School District ought to be ashamed. Unlike China, student free speech and religious freedom rights do not end when they walk through the doors of American classrooms. Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Remember to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Hebrews 13.3 1 Corinthians 12.26 And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, 
all the members rejoice with it. Brothers and sisters, persecution is coming. Believers in Jesus Christ believe in the authority of the Bible. Get yourself spiritually prepared, because true Christians will be persecuted like no other time in history. This persecution will be based off of what the world perceives to be moral and right, and not what the Bible says. The sad thing is that many people who profess to be Christ followers will go the way of the world. These professing Christians are called lukewarm in the book of Revelation and are not saved. The world will persecute true Christians, and scripture tells us the lukewarm Christians will persecute them as well, as we read in Matthew 24, 9 and 10. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Many who professed faith in Jesus as the Messiah in easier times will deny him and cooperate in exposing those who are true believers. The external hatred from the world puts all true believers in Christ under pressure. This in turn produces internal hatred among the professing Christian community during the tribulation. When the pressure comes, those who are not genuine believers will do three things. Fall away, deliver up one another, and hate one another. Matthew 24, 9 and 10 Lay out a future time of great persecution for true believers in Jesus. Many in the church will avoid this persecution by betraying fellow disciples in Christ to the persecutors. Persecution is coming. Brothers and sisters, put on the whole armor of God. Ephesians 6, 10-18 Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. 1 Corinthians 16.13 Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Matthew 24, 6 and 7 And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. To Iran, as the U.S. warns that the regime is just weeks away from acquiring enough fuel to make a nuclear weapon, the U.S. is now back at the table for high-stakes talks. Good morning, Michael. Iran may be in the middle of negotiating a nuclear deal with the United States, but this morning, it's all about death to America. This morning, on the streets of Tehran and in the sky, celebrations saluting the 43rd anniversary of the Islamic Revolution. But the message was the same, down with America. Iran's new, more hardline President Ibrahim Raisi marking the day with a defiant tone, <inaudible> denouncing the West. Just this week, Iran unveiling its newest long-range missile, claiming it can evade detection while easily striking Israel and U.S. bases in the region. Well, it's just weeks. Oh, that's all the time the intelligence community says it would take for Iran to make a nuclear bomb. The Islamic regime has already unveiled new long-range missiles that it claims can reach Israel. The Biden administration says the window is closing to reach a deal with Iran, and it's making risky concessions to get that deal done. Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. One senator called the latest estimate on Iran's timeline for a nuclear weapon sobering and shocking. The White House argues it increases the urgency for the nuclear talks in Vienna. Our talks with Iran have reached an urgent point on mutual return to full implementation of the JCPOA, a deal that addresses the core concerns of all sides is in sight, but if it is not reached in the, un in the coming weeks, Iran's ongoing nuclear advances will make it impossible for us to return to the JCPOA. 
Critics warn the Biden administration is giving up too much in its pursuit of a deal. Ben and Ben Talibu of the Foundation for Defense of Democracy says for more than a year, the White House has been giving into Iran. Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett says lifting sanctions emboldens Iran. Lifting of sanctions and flooding this regime with billions of dollars means more rockets, more UAVs, more terrorist squads, more cyber attacks, more of everything. And not only against us, but also against our American allies in the region and other allies. Ben Talibu says the Biden administration is trying to leave the Middle East but that the Middle East won't leave the U.S. They're unaware that the Islamic Republic is not only looking to get America out, but to become the hegemon to fill the void, which may in fact create the groundwork for a war that may drive the U.S. back in. Just days ago, Iran unveiled a long-range missile with a reported range of 1,440 kilometers or 900 miles putting U.S. bases and Israel well within range. Meanwhile, more than 30 Senate Republicans sent a letter to President Biden demanding the Senate have a say over whether the U.S. rejoins the nuclear deal. The original nuclear agreement in 2015 did not receive Senate approval. I think the last group you want to negotiate with is the government in Iran. Uh, they are bent on destroying Israel. They're bent on destroying the United States. They call us the great Satan. Israel is the little Satan. Why in the world would you ever go to a negotiating table with that group? It just makes no sense to me. Iran's a major sponsor, the major sponsor of terrorism in the region. They are funding Hezbollah. They are funding Hamas. They are delivering drones and missiles to Hamas. They are t t involved in drone attacks on their neighbors. Uh, they're running this proxy war against Saudi Arabia. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. Why would you ever want to negotiate? Our opening story tonight, explosions heard overhead overnight as the IDF responding to an attack from our northern neighbors in Syria. ILTV's Marty Shamroth reporting. Northern Israeli towns waking to warning sirens early Wednesday morning. This as an anti-aircraft missile, fired from Syria, exploding over Umm al-Fam and nearby communities. Syrian sources reporting that the attack was retaliation for alleged Israeli airstrikes near Damascus earlier this month. But in any case, Israeli residents reporting a loud bang from above, and shrapnel later falling near the Chomish outpost, sparking a small fire. But thankfully, there are no reports of casualties. And in fact, the IDF even saying that there was no need for interception, as the ordinance exploded on its own. Regardless of how successful the attack was, however, the launch begging a response from the Israeli military. Israeli authorities consistently vowing to protect the country from any challenges to its sovereignty. So the IDF acknowledging the targeting of several Syrian air defense units, including radar and anti-aircraft batteries that launched missiles at IAF aircraft and Syrian media reporting the attack as coming in two waves. First, Israeli jets firing a missile barrage from within Lebanon, and second, another barrage of surface-to-surface -surface rockets allegedly fired from the Israeli Golan Heights towards Damascus. One Syrian soldier said killed and five more wounded in the strikes. The Bible tells us there are three possible prophecies on the verge of finding fulfillment. Isaiah 17:1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program, Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. Tensions on the Ukraine-Russia Ukraine border rising. President Biden now issuing a new travel advisory and telling Americans in Ukraine they should depart immediately, warning, quote, things could go crazy quickly. That's right. It, it's a grim day here, Cecilia. That stark warning from the president of the United States that Americans here in Ukraine should leave now and that the U.S., he added, will not be able to evacuate them 
if war breaks out. All that makes it very real for the estimated 10 to 15,000 Americans who are living here in Ukraine. Uh, we've been talking to Americans here, and right now, for all the tension, life still seems normal. People are going to work, the kids go to school, everything's open. A young teacher telling me he has a life here, a job, a girlfriend, this is his home. But that feeling could change very fast as the situation continues to deteriorate. Uh, more Russian warships today heading into the Black Sea, and they will be joining what will effectively be a naval blockade of Ukraine. While those massive military exercises between Russia and Belarus are going on just a few miles north of the Ukrainian border here. But the really bad news today, the news off the diplomatic front. Those big talks in Berlin, Ukraine, Russia, France, and Germany just collapsing after nine hours of negotiation. They couldn't even agree to issue a joint statement that any progress might have been made. And more ominously, no further date, no date for further negotiations has been set. So it does feel like the window for a peaceful solution here and for Americans here to get out safely is closing. It seems as though we are on the verge of World War III. Jesus told us in the last days there would be war between the nations. Are we seeing the stage setting taking place to fulfill this prophecy? If so, then we're close to the time Jesus refers to as the worst time in the history of the world as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. If we are that close to the tribulation, then the world is about to see war the likes of this planet has never seen before. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal, war will be unleashed. Resulting from these wars will be famine, pestilence, and death as Jesus breaks the third and fourth seals. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time, as we read in Revelation 6 8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 8 billion, meaning 2 billion people will die during this time. The remaining 17 judgments of God include devastating earthquakes, cosmic disturbances, scorching heat, meteors, 100-pound hailstones, volcanic eruptions, loathsome sores on those who take the mark of the beast, the seas, rivers, and springs of water turn to blood, demons torturing mankind, and a 200 million strong demonic army who will kill another third of mankind, bringing the total to four billion. Psalm 917 The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Washing a fire tonight, threatening homes in California's Laguna Beach. Hundreds of families have been ordered to leave their homes, the fire breaking out this morning. Strong winds and record high temperatures fueling the flames all day today. Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, on the scene tonight. That wildfire blazing through vegetation in Orange County this morning and towards homes. There are hundreds and hundreds of homes down that hillside. What's now being called the Emerald Fire erupting before dawn as families slept. There's a mad scramble to make sure everyone is out of this area. On the ground, hundreds of firefighters racing to gain the upper hand. In the air, helicopters with drop after drop. They've got two boats. Bulldozers up here trying to take out this spot fire. The multiple helicopters circling overhead, and all of it is to try to defend those homes down in the valley. Residents grateful for that lightning quick response. This time they were on it, man. They were good. All the winds have died down, and that's that's a godsend right there. The fire igniting in the midst of record high temperatures and powerful winds. We no longer have a fire season. We have a fire year. Multiple homes ablaze in what's being called the Sycamore Fire east of Los Angeles. They are trying to get the fire that you're looking at right here under control, those two house fires. Unfortunately, though, both of those homes are going to be a total loss. And David, temperatures here in Southern California topping out at over 90 degrees. There has been almost no measurable rain here in over six weeks. One reason, a Cal Fire official telling me these winter wildfires are undeniably caused by climate change. You may have heard the phrase, God's hand of protection. It seems that it is something God would do, keep a person or nation in the shelter of his hand. It also seems logical to think that in his fierce wrath and anger that he would lift his hand. But is it biblical? Yes, it is. Jeremiah 18, 7 through 10. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up, to pull down, 
and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it. In the news these days, we read about and see devastating events, each more unusual, destructive, and unprecedented than the last. They are happening more frequently and more intensely, just as the Bible said would happen just before the return of Jesus Christ. It seems as though God has lifted his hand of protection from the United States, and not just the U.S., but the world as well. One of the purposes of the tribulation is to put an end to sin. And though we are not in the tribulation yet, God is withdrawing his hand. Because who among us, as individuals or as nations, have not sinned? None. Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. These devastating events are not accidents, nor are they merely the natural cycle of things. The world is enduring events that are designed to bring about the end of days and cause us to repent. God is lifting his hand of protection from the nations of the world. No, things will never get back to normal. They will only get worse. As the birth pains continue to become more frequent and more intense, one has to wonder, how close are we to the rapture and the seven-year tribulation? Joel 1.15 Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. As the day of the Lord is upon us, I hope you take comfort in the safety of abiding in the presence of God as we read in Psalm 91, 1-16. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look, and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you, to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Psalm 91 is a protection scripture that believers have turned to for thousands of years whenever there is danger. Remember, the word of God is living and powerful, as we read in Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I firmly believe God is getting ready to judge this world, and I firmly believe He has called me to be a watchman for the people. And if I do not warn you, your blood will be required at my hand. Ezekiel 33, 1-11 Again the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people, and say to them, When I bring the sword upon a land, and the people of the land take a man from their territory, and make him their watchman, when he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning, his blood shall be upon himself, but he who takes warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood 
I will require at the watchman's hand. So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Therefore you, O son of man, say to the house of Israel, Thus you say, If our transgressions and our sins lie upon us, and we pine away in them, how can we then live? Say to them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? Just as the prophet Ezekiel warned the Israelites of impending judgment from Almighty God, the watchmen of our time are warning whoever will listen that God is getting ready to judge an unbelieving and unrepentant world. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. When a person comes to know Jesus as their Savior, they are brought into a relationship with God that guarantees their salvation as eternally secure. To be clear, salvation is more than saying a prayer or making a decision for Christ. Salvation is a sovereign act of God whereby an unregenerate sinner is washed, renewed, and born again by the Holy Spirit as we read in John 3.3 and Titus 3.5. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When salvation occurs, God gives the forgiven sinner a new heart and puts a new spirit within him, as we read in Ezekiel 36:26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The Spirit will cause the saved person to walk in obedience to God's Word, as we read in Ezekiel 36.27 and James 2.26. I will put my Spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. For as the body without the Spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So what about repentance? Repentance is not a work we do to earn salvation. No one can repent and come to God unless God draws that person to himself, as we read in John 6.44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Repentance is something God gives. It is only possible because of his grace. All of salvation, including repentance and faith, is a result of God drawing us, opening our eyes, and changing our hearts. God's long-suffering leads us to repentance, and so does his kindness as we read in 2 Peter 3.9 and Romans 2.4. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Or do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Ephesians 2.8-9 declares, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Works are not the cause of salvation. Works are the evidence of salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. The person who claims to be a Christian, but lives in willful disobedience to Christ, has a false or dead faith and is not saved. In the Bible, 
Repentance results in a change in behavior. That is why John the Baptist called people to produce fruit in keeping with repentance, as we read in Matthew 3.8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. A person who has truly repented of his sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of a changed life as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A person who has not repented of their sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of the works of the flesh, as we read in Galatians 5.19-21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A person who has crucified the flesh and belongs to Christ will give evidence of the Spirit as we read in Galatians 5.22-24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Believers are born again, regenerated when they believe. For a Christian to lose his salvation, he would have to be unregenerated. The Bible gives no evidence that the new birth can be taken away. The Holy Spirit indwells all believers, as we read in John 14, 17. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him or knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit baptizes all believers into the body of Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For a believer to become unsaved, he would have to be unindwelt and detached from the body of Christ. John 3.15 states that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. If you believe in Christ today and have eternal life, but lose it tomorrow, then it was never eternal at all. Hence, if you lose your salvation, the promises of eternal life in the Bible would be in error. Scripture says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, the same God who saved you is the same God who will keep you. Once we are saved, we are always saved. Praise God, our salvation is most definitely, eternally secure. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs?